All right, let's get started. We've got a, we got a lot to cover, and um, I'm hopeful that we have a lot of interaction. Um, definitely a topic that I think we should have some interaction on. So the rules are simple. Chat in your thoughts, ideas, feelings, comments. Um, if you want to debate a topic, I absolutely agree with that. If you want to say that you don't quite agree with something, absolutely would love that. Just put that in chat. And just be respectful about your feedback, your idea uh, feedback as it relates to wanting to debate certain topics. Best thing is you can share books, reference reference sources. People can, you know, you can be working Google as we're talking about this as well, looking at different information pieces too. But we're going to dump into adaptive challenges and working through change. So what we want to be thinking about first is as project management professionals or professionals within complex SDLC environments. We see this pivot that PMI is presenting around being adaptive. PMI understands and sees that the world has changed. And as the world has changed, the, the world needs project management professionals to be changing how they attack the challenges that are in front of it. Because challenges are changing. So we'll spend a good bit of time on this in this presentation talking about types of challenges that project managers are going to face as they attack executing projects in the in their sphere of influence or any SDLC professional working within a specific SDLC software development lifecycle environment. Makes sense. From there, if you heard me talk about it, you can have more time to ask questions. We're going to talk about learning and learning to learn and unlearn. Absolutely, absolutely, in order to deal with the adaptive challenges out there, you have to learn how to learn. I mean, continuous improvement, it can sound like a catchphrase to you. That's a mantra, but there's work that has to be done under that mantra. And the first situation is getting yourself ready to do that learning. Are you ready to learn? And there's a certain mindset that enables you to learn better and more effectively. From there, we'll talk about an adaptive leader itself, that's person who can handle change. We'll talk about your mindset. We'll talk about the leadership growth cycle. And then we'll dig into some of the critical skills. Because what I'm seeing out there more and more is people pushing for problem solving skills, the ability to solve problems. What are the heuristics that you can follow to solve problems? You know, what is the process I use to solve problems? And the key now is it really necessarily isn't a process. You have to walk into it with a mindset or and or and a framework that you can work off of. So that inside the critical skills section, we'll start talking about a problem solving at a very high level. And the key with problem solving is understanding that there is always, there's always a solution. Even if you're a Star Trek fan and what Captain Kirk did to cheat the test so that he, so that he could pass, that was a solving a problem. There are always ways to solve problems. And part of this as project managers is learning how to look at these challenges and where you can solve problems in the face of change, in the face of this rapidly evolving environments that we're in. All right, remember comments, thoughts, ideas, don't hesitate to share them. Let's type, jump into types of challenges. Okay. We'll spend a good bit of time on this slide. What we have is the kind of challenge itself, the problem definition. That means what is going on, execution of the solution, and most importantly is where to work, where, where to work, where the leadership, where the decision-making needs to come from. So we're very used to technical problems. And you know, most cases, we are solving in a project, a technical problem. I need people to do X. All right, in order to do that X, I need this type of work done. I need budgetary authority and we'll go execute. It's clear, 
It's a career directive. It's technically sound. I mean, you can figure out and find the resources. So what you want to look at there is, is it, you know, very clear? Um, there are the resources currently available and move forward and utilize a, a, a decision-making process that we're used to in our bureaucratic hierarchical environments. Decisions made, execute, make the budget. And right now there's still lots and lots of challenges out there that we deal with. Break fix. Technical challenge is gonna be a car repair. Technical challenge is gonna be a server update. Technical challenge is gonna be um, you know, making additional updates to the CRM system, adding an update to the point of sale system, inventory control system, things like that. Now, another type of challenge is we understand what we're trying to trying to get to, but in order to get there, it's going to take some additional learning. We don't know exactly how people use the system. We don't know exactly how our customers engage the system. We don't get that. So we have to start bringing questions to the point by which people are going to be using the system. This is where a product owner position comes into play. This is where a strong business analysis position comes into play in order to provide the voice of both the people that are going to be using the system as well as bringing the voice of the person who's sponsoring it. This is the world of Agile. Agile is a process of iterative working that allows you to learn through the process of creation. The problem is Agile in its in the way we have it with Scrum, with Safe, you know, even Lean, although Lean has does sneak over into the other side. Most of the Agile that we talk about in SPLC environments are around the or learning within the solution. You accept that the problem that is defined is correct. Now let's learn how to best solve that problem. Right, and that's a that that has happening all day long throughout SDLC environments. And the reality is technical and, and technical adaptive challenges are, are handled pretty well. I mean, give or take. But what usually happens now is that a technical adaptive problem is really an adaptive or complex challenge. An adaptive challenge deals with the fact that you really don't know what the problem is. You don't know. You have to learn to figure out what it is that the pro what is that problem? Where is it coming from? And then from there, you have to learn how to fix it. The thing that we miss and that we are challenged with in complex SDLC environments is the system, the mindset, the tools to work in the area of requires learning. There is no certification out there in the space. There is no trade association out in this space. You know, there are point solutions that people would say, oh, well, that's problem definition. Not really. We have tools like Lean Startup. We have tools like design thinking. We have tools like service design that gets into that space. But now we're really talking about space that's around customer experience, around employee experience. So we're getting a lot of CX conversations, a lot of EX conversations. And of course, this ties into the idea of the user experience, the UX side of things. So adaptive challenges, really, from an SDLC environment, we have to begin to pull from some of the marketing capabilities that are out there and the tools used to really, truly connect with your constituency to figure out what's going on. So what you're faced with is, okay, I can start attacking a technical adaptive problem, but I realize that the problem keeps popping back up. So I'm gonna give you an example of this. And some of you might've heard this example if you took my adaptive leader session, but I think it's important to reinforce it. Before we were sold, Softdev was owned by an individual out of, out of New Zealand who had run the business for 30 years. It's amazing. Did an amazing job. It's almost it's almost impossible to run a training business that long. And he he pulled he pulled it off. And 
successfully sold it, which is another thing that is next to impossible. But we, you know, in the later years, we struggled. We struggled with revenue sometimes up, then revenue down, revenue up, pop profit down. Then we, we were just, it was always this cycle. We couldn't get to that, you know, more consistent growth factor. And any, anyway, the cycle also had an ultimately a downward trajectory. So what's going on? And what's happening in this environment? Well, basically, when you really looked at it, it came down to a word. And that word was agnostic. It came back to an emotion. It came back to a belief. One side of the company believed that agnostic meant we only do agile. We don't train on specific frameworks. We're not going to get into certified scrum training. We're not going to do safe training. We want to talk about agile as it is. That's what we're going to train on. Other side of the company felt that agnostic meant give the customer what they wanted. We're not going to die in any one hill, per se. If they want this, we'll give them this. If they want that, we'll give them that. We'll be really good at doing it, but we're not in a position to tell someone that, no, we're not going to do that, or no, you shouldn't do that. Now, think about that. Think about how that permeates through the rest of the company. It changes your positioning on marketing. It changes your sales positioning. It changes your service delivery mentality. It changes how you how you ultimately go to market. Both sides, it's, a, it's significant. So we were trying to do things at certain levels of technical. We might add more salespeople. We might um, adjust the marketing plan more. We might make more efficiencies in service delivery. We may try to package courses together. But one side might have been trying to push for their agnostic sell everything. The other side was trying to push towards, okay, we'll try these things out. And it became very incongruous. Basically, we were trying to solve an adaptive challenge using technical mindset with some agile. Now that's a go-to-market solution, but I know each one of you can start thinking about this and seeing this. Now look at your home. Start with your home environment. Think about situations where you've seen the ups and downs, and maybe there's a different way to attack that problem. You know, but look at some of your stuff that you might do after work, whether you're in social groups or trade associations or, or church groups. And you can see when there's certain problems that just always stay there. There might be a problem that we can never really get growth, but there might be a problem that we can never really be profitable. There might be a problem that we really never get this thing done that we always talk about, but it never happens. And that's one of the things in order to attack, in order to attack an adaptive challenge, you have to start seeing the flags for it. What are the, oh my gosh, that are out there that attack and show that, that it's an adaptive challenge and start looking at these things. One of the really interesting things about the soft dead example, there was very, very heavy emotional responses from both sides. A passionate response, like this is how we should do it. No, this is how we should do it. And that passion, you know, leads to more conflict. Talked about it recurring, it kept coming back. You know, there was times that we just wanted to avoid the issue and operate, just wanted to make a profit because when you're it's a, an individually owned company at a certain size, Profit becomes very important because there's a significant risk on their back. Casualties. Look at that casualty one. Any change does have casualties, but the more adaptive the challenge, the higher level of potential for casualties. And casualties can be, you're not doing this way any longer, so you lose a power base. A casualty may be a function that gets lost, so you lose your informational or expert power base. It might be that your position is completely terminated. And for us, that feels like death. So there's an emotional response associated with that as well. But understanding that in, in, in chaos, you'll be lots of casualties. It's almost like you got to get used, used to being a casualty yourself. You have to be prepared to be a casualty because you drive things that force casualties 
when you're solving adaptive challenges. So this is a great meter to look at the three or more, if three of these things pop up and you're looking at a specific challenge you've been trying to solve, you gotta really say to yourself, okay, okay, I really don't know what the problem is. I really don't know what the problem is. And I'm wasting a ton of time and I'm wasting a ton of money trying to solve it a certain way. So this is a good slide to look at after the, after the fact. So let's look at examples. So you have the technical problems. They're easy to identify. You can have an authoritative position to solve it. Requires some change, but adjustments, but nothing that's going to cause significant casualties. And the solution can be done quick. All right. So for me, an example would be my weight. And you might've heard this before. I am, I am large, but I have been small before. I've probably been over a hundred pounds smaller in my life. So I've easily lost, you know, 400 pounds, but gained 500 pounds. And it's been like this my whole life, but it's in, a, in the upward trajectory since I was like 32, 33. What's going on? The problem is I'm trying to solve an adaptive problem with technical solutions. I'll stop eating peanut butter, or I won't eat after six, or I'll try the fasting diet, or I'll go on Weight Watchers, or I'll exercise more, or I'll pull out all my sugar. Ultimately, I have to look at myself and understand what it is I believe that impacts my ability to make this significant adaptive change, because it's an adaptive challenge. And there are now weight loss devices and apps that really look at the behavioral psychology associated with weight loss. And that's part of the fact I got to change my beliefs. Until I can change my beliefs, I will not be able to change the problem. And then ultimately have to make it a structural part of my process. And you can do so if I change the beliefs, just like right now. Weight gain is a structural part of my process. You know, and usually it's a tool that I use at night to get comfortable and pull in a lot of calories at night because it's my comfort time. Now, this is a better example. This is, this is my more favorite example. And this example is work from home. And, you know, people say, I predicted this or I predicted that. I can tell you, I can probably bring back video or voice evidence, recorded evidence that I did this. Before COVID, work from home was an adaptive challenge. It hit a number of these rules. There was no rule, there was no reason or logic for who could work from home and who couldn't. It was a recurring problem because people were asking for it and never really seeing anything solved. There was a lot of avoidance where people just said, now nah, we're not going to do it. Um, people would leave companies, and this is what began happening with the Great Resignation. After COVID, you see that Great Resignation occurring. So we know it's an adaptive challenge. Then, then COVID hit. It became a technical challenge. It had to be done. It was easy to identify. Either work from home or a company dies. It had a number of, of simple connectivity and, and technology changes. They might pretend it like it was complicated, but it was easy to understand, easy to do. They were already doing it. Sent home, sent some materials home, sent some cameras home, or told people to buy cameras, set the right communication up, readjust the VPNs, and poof, you're working from home. And very few of us on this call had to stay at work. Maybe there was one or two emergency personnel that had to, but for the most part, we operated at home, whereas before we couldn't because of beliefs. Now look what's happened. And I'm not one to say that work from home is not good, and I'm not one to say that work from home is, is, is good. What I'm saying is that it's now an adaptive challenge again because people are being asked to come back to work and they don't understand why. What's the logic? What's the reasoning? What's the, what's the issue? And when you look at it, it becomes an emotional issue. And it becomes a belief issue. The belief, the foundational belief still is that people can be, people are not as productive at home. And that comes from a fundamental belief of lack of trust. 
even now seeing the things like work 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 in the office people get more professional development they get more mentoring that we get more coaching this just came out i forgot which report yesterday but now you can see the the differences now i'm not getting any questions is there any thoughts comments yeah, my office is there is not enough collaboration. Yeah, this is what you're getting now. You're getting, Shannon, you're getting this hybrid goofy thing, right? Whereas you can get you can get that collaboration. There are ways to do it, but it goes back to a belief issue. Any comments or thoughts besides Shannon's thought? Sorry about me moving around this stupid cord. I'm like being spastic. Hope I don't look too crazy. Well, definitely share your thoughts on this. And again, what I'm trying to do is say, here's an opportunity to see a mindset and try to adjust and see how you can tackle these adaptive challenges. Kathleen says, honestly, I feel that I'm getting more professional development than I got in the office. Okay. What does your organization believe? That's the question. You know, and I think if your organization is believing that, then it will stay down the path of looking at the productivity gains of working from home. It's an adaptive challenge. And because also there's an incongruency between what the organization thinks and what the individuals think as Kathleen and Shannon are, are showing there in the, in the chat. Any other feedback, thoughts, comments? Don't hesitate to share them. So really what I'm getting at here is adaptive challenges. So finally see that people want it. So it's being provided. It's an essential good. The organization is starting to see that. And now it's, it's, it's adjusting it to, it's now solving the mindset because they see the essentiality associated with it. They believe that without it, they're going to lose and they're going to lose productivity. Because that's ultimately what's going on within companies. Companies at the SDLC level, at the software development lifecycle level, it's very simple. It's productivity. The more productive the team of professionals in the SDLC environment can be, the more value the company generates, the better the share price or the better profit. But all this problem has to deal with the fact that complex systems are different. For the vast majority of our business operation between the 1900s, I mean, not 1900s, the 1600s and now, we had a very command and control environment because there was change, but not rapid change. So Jeffrey says, I believe it depends on your level. Folks started out their career and not provided over the over the shoulder and structure. Managers are not able to hear or see what's going on. More experienced folks just want their managers to stay in there and stay out. Okay, so here's the skinny, Jeffrey. You are now working on trying to solve an adaptive challenge with some logic. What's the rationale? What's the logic? And what's the logic that the company is going to establish as part of the push? And then you can implement based on the problem definition and, and figuring that out. So Jeffrey, you are actually part of doing the value analysis on the front end of the decision that should be made to make to, to put a plan together to attack it, and not make it random. Oh, look at that. We moved from a training department to a learning and development. And that's this is a Kathleen mindset shifts are so important. You're so right. But look at this about complex systems. Complex systems deal with rapid change wonderfully. They're independent, decentralized agents. They, they self-organize without rules. This crazy activity occurs. You know, even when they're not, you know, they're being self-organized. The best information is at that point of chaos. And then a basic rules generate crazy amounts of stuff going on. As adaptive people, we have to figure out a way to shift our mindsets to deal with adaptive challenges to start looking at the comparisons between complex systems in our human operation systems, whether they're at home, in your in your 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 outside work life and your work life. But humans are different than natural systems. And this is where all the problems occur. 
as you begin to start trying to say, how do I deal with and how do I work through adaptive challenges and how do I deal with this change? You really have to look at yourself. Starts because this idea of adaptive, it's all about individual agents driving empowerment. That's what happens in natural systems. Individual agents driving empowerment and then self-organizing when it needs to operate. And of course, we're seeing that in the SDLC environment as it relates to when a problem is solved. We're not seeing that as much in the problem definition space. So what are some of the problems? What you have is emotional distortions and cognitive distortions. It's a whole separate presentation I do, but ultimately to deal with change, you have to understand how your brain operates and the emotional distortions and the cognitive distortions that impact your ability to handle change appropriately. The reality is human beings hate change, hate it, because the thing that drives us is hardwired for pessimism. It's hardwired for negativity. It's hardwired for challenges that deal with surviving in the current state. It wants to stay alive and it wants to work efficiently. So we are hardwired to not want to change, even if it's 100% or 99% in some cases. It's all about loss. We fear loss, loss of our power base, whether it's our informational power base or expert power base. You know, we are fearful, even our positional power base. And that's a thing called loss regret. Adaptive leaders must always put you, I mean, adaptive leaders have always put you in the business of assessing, managing, distributing, and providing context for losses that move people through these losses to a new place. Look at that. Change, I'm going to write it down, change drive, change drives losses. Heavier the change, heavier the losses. And this is what I talk about as it relates to dealing with change. I talk about this so much. Can you get comfortable with being uncomfortable? That's the mantra. Can you learn to be uncomfortable? How can you learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable? Because it's our basic brain operation that teaches us to only be comfortable in things that are known. That's the first step. Training and supporting and helping professionals around you understand their brain operation, understand the impact of their brain operation as it relates to their ability to get things done and then coach them on the things that they have to learn and do. And really, this ties back to cognitive behavioral therapy. And the idea that beliefs drive thoughts, thoughts drive feelings, thoughts and feelings together drive actions. Business works because of execution. You want to return on execution. You execute by doing things. If your belief is incongruent with what the organization wants, the organization is telling you to do, your execution is not going to happen. If you're feel for of the change, it's not going to happen. So getting it, this is the resistor that we have to constantly dig in and think about. If there's any questions on that, let me know. Any thoughts, comments? So if there's casualties, you have to learn. The reality is, and you might've seen this slide multiple times if you've taken presentations with me before, but it's so critical. The reality is we got to constantly build, rebuild, build, rebuild, build, rebuild. We ultimately have to be experts on learning. I like to tell, tell people when they're in an interview environment to talk about their intellectual curiosity. They're talking about their ability to learn fast. Talk about their ability not to be beholden to past experiences be open to new adjustments and challenges. 
Those are the value attributes and adaptability. How intellectually curious you are, you know, how you fast you can learn. Are you open to learning other things? things and, and not just relying on your set experience. Those are so important, but you have to know when to learn. The reality is we don't learn when we're under that stress and pressure of getting something done because we're myopically focused on that getting something done. Any additional, yeah, Kathleen, curiosity in change is really so critical. You have to force your brain to trust that you'll be able to get over that impediment, even if you're impacted. So let's be curious about it. And the older we get, there's an unfounded thought process that older workers cannot be curious. Older workers cannot relearn. Older workers don't learn quickly. That's not the case. Neuroplasticity tells us that that's not the case. Curiosity is inherent, hopefully, which, no, John, that's my debate. I don't think curiosity is necessarily inherent. I see it just the opposite. Me too, John. And I think that's a great point. And you want to bring that point. But I think, I think most people are not curious because they live in their protective bubble that their brain puts themselves in. It has nothing to do with them. It has to do with what they have and what they were taught and what the brain tells them to do. So curiosity is a risk factor. When we talk about it, curiosity kills the cat, right? I mean, that's an adage that we know out there. Curiosity, though, is the wellspring of dealing with change and being supported and adjusting change. But right now, you're in environments, you're in environments that you're hot, red hot at work. So it's very difficult for you. Okay, John says, I don't mean that curiosity is inherent to all people, but that is driven by hopefulness. Yes, yes, that's right a belief, but you have to fight that battle, but your brain operates on hopelessness. Your brain operates on fear. And then Kathleen says, meaning older people have seen so much more, they have the experience that curiosity paves the way for change. I, I think what happens is most people think that older workers have seen so much and they rely on that instead of trying to push that aside. I'll get to that with the concept of unlearning. Oh yeah. Shan, absolutely. Curiosity is always going to be met with pushback. But that doesn't mean you can't you can stop being curious. But in work environments, we're usually red hot. We're just driven. So whenever somebody tries to bring something new into us, we can't absorb it. The same as if you're in your comfort zone. If you're in, and this is where the status quo becomes the invisible killer. You get in your comfort zone, everything's operating okay. Where is the need to learn? Why should I learn? And this is biggest problem and change is that our brain, brain keeps us in homeostasis. We get comfortable. We do a job well in an environment that's well, and all of a sudden we get disrupted and we weren't prepared for it. Even in our comfort time, we have to push ourselves to distress. We have to push ourselves. Good for you, Shannon. I, I'm glad that you persevere. That's awesome. So in our yellow zone, we have to constantly remind ourselves to get to the green zone. I used to call this being woken up. In the red zone, we have to find ways to reduce being lean, reduce some of the non-critical work so we can be in that green zone. And what that green zone allows, first off, is we, we're protected by responsibility. The more that you can give others around you responsibility, the more you're going to learn. It's simple. Conflict, dissenting voices, and other perspectives. Look at that. That is the bedrock of learning. How is our culture dealing with that right now? It's not necessarily that one side or the other side of the culture is right or wrong. It's that nobody listens to each other. And then we put ourselves in communities of like-mindedness, and that's another protective bubble that we don't want to listen to anything else. It's going to be very difficult to recondition us. But in complexity, we need more of conflict, dissenting voices, and perspectives. The problem is we have complexity and rapid change, but our culture and environment is leading more towards closed off communities of relevance, which are blockers 
to conflict because there's no conflict or very little conflict in those communities. And if there is, just somebody goes out and builds another community that's more like-minded instead of staying within it. So how are you at allowing conflict to surface? Home, home environment, non-professional environment, professional environment. Where and when are you allowing dissenting voices to get into the mainstream and be able to be heard? And then finally, at least, at the very least, searching out other perspectives. As it relates to the adaptive challenges I face in this new environment I'm working in with SoftEd after running my own company, I've had to constantly seek new perspectives and really do something that I'm going to call unlearning. Not, not call it, but it's called unlearning. And so ultimately, your learning amplifiers is putting yourself in situations that you have not been in before. Trying out a new way of learning something. Trying out a new way of attacking a problem. Giving yourself time. And then ultimately being comfortable with failure as you go through the process to figure out what is the best way. For me, with weight loss, I'm going through this process to ultimately figure out what is the right way for me. And then I, if I can put myself in those processes and teach and fail, ultimately, I can look at it as those failures help me get to where I need to be. And what we really want to deal with a change is unlearning. Barry O'Reilly wrote the book on unlearning. Is the concept of being able to get rid of things that are no longer valuable. So first, you have to understand in your experience set what is valuable and what isn't valuable. So you got to look at the essential versus the non-essential or the dispensable versus the indispensable. How good are you at a, as a judge at that level of your skills and experience and what you're doing? So essential versus indispensable. Then if you're freeing up and pushing aside that experience, you're opening yourself up to learn more. So it's not just throwing it away, but it's then being open to learn. And your mantra here is the belief that Although I was successful in the past, that success in the past is not going to give me continued success in the future. And that's scary, right? We want to enjoy the existence we have. But we have to also change to fit the environment that we're within. And right now, the environment we are, are with, we're within forces us to learn how to enjoy being uncomfortable. And from there, being able to then look and see how you can change and adjust because you're constantly seeking out new things. You're constantly talking to other people about other situations. This means that there's no analysis paralysis because you're going to make decisions. You're going to make decisions. You're going to execute. Then you're going to learn. You're going to make other decisions, other executes. You know, as the old adage goes, today is the first day of your rest of your life. Absolutely. There's always a starting point. Regardless, there's always a starting point. Then you learn, ebb, and adjust from there. The, the worst thing that can happen in change is perfectionism. Perfectionism kills you in the face of change. And I see a lot of that, especially folks who have the expert power base. Actually, folks who've really you know, bought into the fact that their experience is ex significantly valuable. And I see a lot of disruption to those people's careers and lives because of that mindset. So mindset shifts. When you start looking at this idea of change, an adaptive leader gets an understanding of how to deal with change. So they have a strategy map. And they have to look at how they are acting and interacting within the complicated, complex environment. That get on the balcony is looking at something from a 360 perspective. Have you ever thought about what it's like in your kid's shoes? Just really sat down and thought for a second. The impacts, the challenges, 
the influences that they're under, getting that 360 to understand that, not so much that you commiserate with them, but you understand and see their challenges. Then you can decide which ones are technical challenges, T's versus the adaptive challenges. What inspires people? How can you drive that? A song beneath the words. How This is where inspiration comes in. From there, that political thinking, I know this turns a lot of people off, but politics has a very positive definition, connotation. It's about negotiation, about getting things done. It's about a system that can be built that allows for repeat and scale and growth and ultimately coming up with the best possible decision. So thinking and acting politically is something that could definitely be that's something that definitely, sorry about that. I'm getting something over here I want to shut down. Hold on a second. Why is this happening? So, sorry about that. So basically, you want to be able to drive that political back and forth. From there, you want to orchestrate the conflict. You want to, you want to manage it, not attack it yourself. And that ties back to giving back to the work. But ultimately, the most important thing in this is when you take a position, you move forward, you push it through, you hold steady. You don't just give up and walk away. You hold steady. And a lot of people have a very difficult time with that. So you want to grow. And the first thing you want to grow with regard to dealing with change is this idea of self-organization. Can you effectively self-organize? And this starts with you. Can you operate in a self-organized environment? Meaning, can you take on the autonomy and the responsibility that, that's required to operate in that environment? To be able to take responsibility for the decisions and the actions that you're working on. Even in a closed bureaucratic environment, you can still act as a self-organized agent. You can still take responsibility in the areas that you can take responsibility for. And then you want to build this spiral. As you deal with ad being adaptive, first and foremost, you have to have a focus point. Because if you're always comfortable, if you're comfortable being uncomfortable, where is your focus point then? Your focus point isn't on the base of experience you have. The focus point isn't kind of create equilibrium or balance. Your focus point should be on your customers. In any system, you have customers. In your home environment, you have customers. In your non in your outside professional environments, you have customers. In your professional environments, you have customers. So really, when you deal with change, you want to focus in on that customer. And then from there, you want to work in those short cycles because you could only solve and see adaptive problems by working in shorter cycles. And then from there, understanding how to make that decipher of value we talked about, essential versus indispensable. Communicating consistently, that's the transparency aspect. Learn, knowing how to learn. This whole cycle does not work unless you can learn and adapt. And then most importantly, the, the, the concept of thinking politically is this idea of relationships. The value of relationship. There's a cognitive dissonance called reciprocity. Some people call it quid pro quo. And its basis, it has a very negative connotation. That means emotional definition. But the reality is that's how you forge deep relationships. You take care of one another. You help. You seek out support and, and, and help in certain situations. It, and there's always a feeling of give back in that. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm going to help someone because I know ultimately because of that help, they're going to be there if I need them. And that's not a bad thing. You're not, you're not doing it from a manipulative standpoint, but you get those relationships and they can help you deal with the change, deal with the chaos that's necessary to delight your customers. And this ladder is important. None of us are in a CEO level on this call. Probably no C, C, no other C-suite folks. We all lead. The key to dealing with change 
and constant change is us, as I talked about. Our ability to espouse being uncomfortable, espouse indispensable versus dis dispensable, understand our curiosity to learn and grow and adapt, and ultimately live on this sheet. In your locus, in your focus of your work, are you at number seven? Meaning, are you doing things and going after things based on the main premise and not feeling like you have to go back and get everything checked? Sh uh, you cannot live and change in number one, two, three, or four. That's a, that's a kiss of death. In change, no one person can tell you what to do or give you permission to do something because they don't know. All they're going to do is make a non-logical, irrational decision, and most likely it's going to be an emotional decision. That's why as things get more complex, you push the decision-making closer and closer to what's going on and who is going on, and they make the decisions. And ultimately, can you empower yourself at your locus of work to do number six, seven? And that's where you start providing ultimately the most value in a company. So the critical skills for adaptive leaders will end here. We got about you know, seven, eight minutes. Take a look at your presence. You want to be fully aware in the moment you're operating. I'm trying to be aware of the chat. I'm trying to be aware of the slides and the flow of the presentation. I'm trying to be aware of time and how that matches up with things. And my presence was screwed up when I attacked another device here that was ringing. I should have been better prepared for that so that device wouldn't ring. So there was a missing element of my presence. And how did you react emotionally, especially if you don't know me? And so some people might have been in presentations before. You would have a different reaction to someone who didn't know me because it looks like I don't care. It looks like I'm disorganized. So presence is how you present yourself, how you look, how you're dressed. It's how you are observing the environment. It's how you are judging, meaning not judging how open your, your whole body language is. And you know that you're walking in with some biases. Any meeting you go into, you should know the biases you're walking into. Well, I really want this, 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 and this. I could do a much better job at that, especially in the current place I work. I do a better job at that when I'm coaching. I don't do a good job of that in these situations. All right, silence. I get a really good reaction to silence recently. People are really seeing the value of taking time, especially those in a product owner position or a business analysis position or any type of information gathering position where they allow people to think. It might even be good to allow them to see what you're going to talk about in advance so they can think about it. It might even be good for you in event, when you get into the meeting to give them 10 minutes to review and look at things that you're going to talk about or five minutes to do that because you're getting an instant reaction, it's not a thought through reaction. And so you're succumbing in a lot of cases to the emotional biases that we face, fear, fight, flight, or freeze. And most of the thought processes be around that. What you want to get is get them thinking more deeply about the things that you're talking about. So working to resist the situation to jump in, to answer the questions for them. So give yourself time in your time box to do that. When people used to force me for an answer, I felt they were, they were, they were manipulating me because they knew I would make an emotional decision. In a lot of cases, just to get rid of it because it was probably a time issue. Because as we know, if we're too stressed out, we're not going to seek other perspectives. We're just going to make a, a decision. Radical candor. How direct can you be professionally, supportively? How can you do that in a way that you're looking to help the environment grow, not in the way that people perceive you trying to make yourself better? 
because that's one of the biggest challenges associated with this idea of with this idea of um, with this idea of learning and supporting others. Growth versus fixed mindset. The growth mindset is a mindset of possibilities, is a mindset of change, is a mindset of growth that I can be comfortable being uncomfortable, that I can grow and adapt and learn. So that fixed mindset is very important. Critical thinking. Critical thinking is about really deeply engaging and taking the time to engage the information that you have available to yourself to think about it, to debate it. That's part of what I asked about in the first part of this presentation. Is ultimately the idea that you want to get and understand what you're listening to. You want to process it. You want to think about it. You want to debate it. So you can come up with other thoughts and other ideas that you can then utilize in how you're trying to solve a problem. And there's a lot of conversation now about this concept called deep literacy. And this deep literacy concept is getting into this idea of how you are engaging the information around you. David, I can't do it. Too much time, too much stuff going on. I get it. How do you lessen the other stuff so you can focus on the key elements? Where are the time opportunities to start critically thinking? One of the best things you can do is give yourself some time to think. And then looking at the system itself. As you're critically thinking, it's not just you, it is the totality of the things around you. And everything revolves around data. How are you at a critical skill looking at the use and util utilization of data and how that data helps you make decisions? but it doesn't, shouldn't make the decision for you. It should make decisions. Well, there's the materials. I've got um, five minutes left. Any additional questions or comments? Well, Kathleen, thank you so much. Any additional questions or comments? I hope you got value out of this. Sorry about the little bit of distraction there. Have a great rest of your day, all. Thank you so much. We'll send out the slides. We'll send out the recording. You get all that good stuff as well. Thank you so much. Bye.